everybody, and welcome to AMC Mailbag, the all mailbag show here on AMC Movie News, where all we do is take your questions. I'm Ashley Mova, and if you've got a question that you want answered on air, you can send it over anytime to amcmovietalk at gmail.com. You could get it answered on Movie Talk or Mailbag, and sitting with me to answer those questions right here, right now, is the editor in chief of AMC Movie News, John Campia. John, how are you? I'm good. Welcome back. Thank you've you. You've been gone for so long. Thank you. It's- I know. It's been. It's been, uh, I feel like I served my American duty and I'm yes. back. You were doing jury duty, right? I was doing, it's like a nerve wracking process. I never want to go through that again. <laughs> it's so scary. You'll have to tell me all about it sometime. Yeah, okay, here we go. The first question comes from Matt D and they write, Hey, AMC friends. Recently, I have been hearing a lot of talk on the show about actors playing major roles as characters in movies. For example, Hugh Jackman as Wolverine, Patrick Stewart as Professor X, Tom Cruise as Ethan Hunt. I was wondering if these actors who play these characters so long and audiences begin to see them as the character, do they begin to have any say in how the movie is made? Like Hugh Jackman saying, I should have a cigar in my mouth and my shirt off for this scene as Wolverine <laughs> Wood. Thanks, guys. Phase three rocks. Um, well, I mean, the short answer to that question is no. Um, just because you've played a character a long time doesn't somehow give you authority over mm-hmm. that character. But that's the short answer. The real answer is a little more complex. And like anything in the movie business, it kind of depends from situation to situation. But basically speaking, and there are exceptions to this, basically speaking, um, no, actors don't have a say. But because actors are like the guardians, they're the caretaker of their character, right? See, the director is in charge of five million different things going on. He's in charge of everything that's going on. So whereas an actor can really focus just on their character, any director worth their salt will listen to the caretakers of the individual characters. Don't necessarily do what they say, but uh, if a director is smart, what they will do is, if, a, if an actor has an idea about their character, because remember, that actor is living that character, mm-hmm. right? And just d- focusing on nothing but that character. So if they have some insight into that character, the director should listen. So if an actor has an idea, let's, let's go to your example, for instance, about Hugh Jackman playing Wolverine. If he goes to his director, Brian Singer, say, and says, hey, you know, I kind of feel like in this shot, Wolverine might have a cigar and have his shirt off. Brian Singer would be wise to not necessarily do that, but at least listen to Hugh Jackman and listen to the suggestion and then think about it. Now, once again, Brian Singer has the responsibility of worrying about everything, and he might say to Hugh Jackman, "Uh, actually, I mean, you're right, normally he would, but we can't have him have a cigar right now because that would affect this, 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 and this, like all the other things around. So if a director is smart, he will listen to the input from their actors, but then still ultimately do what they think should be done. And an actor, if they're really doing their job and they think their their character might do something or if they think of an idea that might be helpful, they should go to the director and share the idea. But at the same time, once they share the idea, not think that the director owes it to them to do whatever their idea is. You know, it's still the director's movie. They make the decisions. Now, you're going to get some, you know, situations where there are exceptions. Sylvester Stallone, for example, he did not direct the last Expendables movie. But he was the star in it. They brought in another director. But Sylvester Stallone is still like the guy in charge of that movie. He's still like the producer of the movie or whatever. So that's a different situation. Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible. He's not directing it, but it is his franchise. He's the producer of it and everything too. So there's, there'll be some different dynamics there. But generally speaking, no. The actor doesn't get authority over what their character does or do, does not do. But if a director is a good director, he will let them have a say and let them you know share ideas and things like that. So you gave that example of Tom Cruise. Do you think a bigger name kind of gets more um, more pull and more say on stage than or on film on camera than um, just a regular everyday actor um, I I think probably I mean there's there's some nightmare stories like yeah look up online tell uh, us tell we've, us we've, we've talked about curious. this one before <laughs> we've, we've talked about this one before look up online Kevin Smith talking talking about his experience with Bruce Willis mm. on what was that buddy cop movie Fact checker Jonathan, can you look up that the name of that? It's the Kevin Smith directed film with Bruce Willis, and I can't. I think it might have been um, the guy from Thirty Rock. I can't. Tim, not Tim Meadow. Um, I'm totally Tracy Morgan. I think it was Tracy Morgan in it with him. But anyway, uh, Jonathan's looking up the name of that movie. But because Bruce Willis is a big, huge movie star, 
Cop Out, thank you. The name of that film was Cop Out. So look this up. Uh, Kevin Smith telling stories about Cop Out, and he's, it was just a nightmare. Oh, that's he said, awkward. Working with Bruce Are they ever going to work together again? I doubt it. <laughs> yeah. I really, really doubt it. And it, besides, the movie ended up being really bad anyway, <laughs> so it doesn't really matter. But so there, I'm sure there are situations where a person starts to become a star, mm -hmm. and they think now because they're a star, they're entitled to sure. whatever. And I'm sure there's some directors that are just pains in the ass. They're difficult to work with, and, and sometimes it's their fault. But I think generally speaking, if you're a director and you've got a star in your film who's a bigger star than you, which is a lot of the time, the bigger that star is, probably the more intimidated you are. Probably you know that the studio is paying that actor more than they're paying you. Uh, so there's probably more of an intimidation factor. And because of all that, then I think the director probably takes what the actor has to say a little bit more. Um, it's a poor actor that leverages that power, I think. It's yeah. it's a very poor actor, I think, that leverages that power. Uh, the director is the director for a reason. Let them do it. And, and you know, it's, it's like anything else, though. There are exceptions to everything. But, yeah, I think, generally speaking, the bigger the star, probably the more pull they have. All right. Uh, next question comes from Andre Everett, and they write, Hello, AMC. Love the show. I just heard the announcement for the live-action Disney Mulan movie. I know that right now in Hollywood, there isn't a young Asian actress on the come-up, but I just want to know who would be your dream casting for Mulan. I think either Jamie Chung or Rila Fukushima, two very talented actresses, that would be great for the role. Thanks, and bring on the filthy. I would be biased in this because Jamie Chung is actually a friend of mine. Um, oh, right. Yeah, she her and, and my wife, Anne, were actually sorority sisters. They were sorority sisters together. <laughs> um, so it's pretty cool whenever we're on set of, of a movie that she's in or whether she's whatever she's around, her and Anne always hang out. And she, uh, she's actually a, a just wonderful girl. I really, really like her. The problem, though, that you're going to run into with, with a Jamie Chung, um, Mulan is supposed to pass herself off as a man. Jamie's pretty hot. Yeah. Jamie's pretty hot. Yeah. I, I, mm -hmm. I I don't know, no matter the, the you know, the <laughs> magic of the world of Hollywood makeup, I don't know you're gonna convince many guys that Jamie Chung is a dude. That, you know, that that Jamie's packing heat. I don't think you're gonna be able to convince <laughs> anybody of that. Uh, but she is a she's remarkably gifted, but like I said, I'm a little bit biased because I know her. Um however, on the other side of that that spectrum, you're talking about Rila. Rila is a very interesting name to bring up because I do think she's awfully talented. Um, I used to watch the TV show Arrow and she played Tatsu Yamashiro in that and she was really quite good in it. She played Yukio in the Wolverine film so a lot of fans will recognize her and I actually think she's quite good. Um, so she's actually a name I would be pretty okay with. Um, you know, then you go more established names like a Ji Ye Zhang, but the problem is she, she might be a little bit old for the role now. And I, I think because it's a Disney film, they're going to want their actors to speak. Well, I do believe they're going to get a Chinese actress. I believe they're also going to want this the language of the film to be very clear, mm -hmm. pure English. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's just not something to, that uh, Zhang Ji Ye can do very well. So, um, yeah, I mean, I like these names and everything, but I would have to go with Rila because. I just think she's, <laughs> she, number one, she's a very good, gifted actor, actress. Um, and me saying that Jamie's too good looking, that's not me suggesting that Rila is not attractive. Mm -hmm. She's a super attractive woman at the same time. Um, but I'm not biased for Rila. So I, I would say go with Rila. I think she's a pretty good choice. Now maybe you have some personal insight into this because All you right. know her. Um, how did Jamie separate herself from the reality world? Because I think that's one of the hardest thing and uh, things an actor can do because she started on the real world. Yep. But now she is like, and known as an actress, not even, yeah. oh, she started here and now she's kind of trying to do things. Like, she is an actress. How did she separate herself from that? Uh, that's a really good question. I mean, she started small. She started with smaller things and worked up. And then I, I think her real big break, uh, big break, was with that horrible Dragon Ball movie. Uh, where she played like the love interest of the lead <laughs> character. She wasn't one of the main characters in the movie, but she played the love interest <laughs> of the lead character. I think that kind of introduced her. And then, of course, she got that the role in The Hangover, playing Ed Helms' uh, fiance, and then later on wife and things. And then she was in Man with the Iron Fist. I actually thought she was really good in Man with the Iron Fist. Um, and then she was just... Oh, and actually, speaking of Jamie and Mulan, she just played Mulan in... Uh, what's that Disney show? Uh, but with all the fairy tales... It's really super popular right now, and Once I can't upon remember. A time. Once upon a time, yeah, Jamie <gasps> just spent like a season playing Mulan in Once Upon a Time. Oh, I think so. I didn't know that. So there's a little bit. I think that pretty much disqualifies Jamie from that. <laughs> but it's like anybody. You gotta if you have talent, mm -hmm. 
you have good representation, you make smart moves, and you start small, then you know you can go anywhere, even if you start out in a rally. A reality and it show. was her UC Riverside ex education. Yes, we went and, to the same college. And whatever Kappa Beta Mia Kappa Sia. Kappa Gamma. Kappa Kappa Gamma. Okay, if, if that's the name of the, I'm not going to pretend I know the name <laughs> of the sorority, but <laughs> yes, I'm sure her connections and that is what did it. All right, Brian Olivis writes, "Hey guys, I've been a fan since your early days, and I cannot congratulate you all enough for Phase Three. Now that this is out of the way, for I was wondering what you." all thought on a sequel for Locke. Locke is a great movie and I loved it and I especially loved when Ivan would talk to his father. I would love to see him arriving home the next day to his family. I hope I'm not alone on this. Thank you. You're alone. Aww. Uh, well, actually, let me change that. You're not alone in, in being somebody who would be interested to see another Locke movie. Um, Locke with Tom Hardy, incredible film. It's one of these films very difficult to do where it's just one person in the movie incredibly difficult to shoot those and as an actor incredibly challenging because you really show your stuff because you you got nothing else to lean on all your weaknesses are going to be laid bare your weaknesses as a performer as an actor are going to be laid out bare because there's nothing to hide it with it's just you and that's why when you get like tom hanks and castaway ryan reynolds and buried tom hardy and luck it really shows off what these guys are made of and what they can do however that being said um you will never see a sequel to Locke, at least not one that's going to play in theaters. Locke made, hold on to your seats, $1.3 million at the box office. 1.3. Now, it wasn't a big wide release, granted, but even for the limited release, that wasn't great. Uh, I'm sure it got more word of mouth and everything like that, but at that pace... You know, Tom Hardy is about to be in one of the biggest films of the year with Mad Max. Then he's about to be in one of the biggest films of next year in Suicide Squad. Oh, sorry, he backed out of that, didn't he? We won't go into that story. Uh, but he's, you know, he's about to play Rocket Man. I mean, he's about to do a lot of things. At this point, you can't pay him his salary. You can't pay him what he's going to be worth mm -hmm. at this point. Um, because, I mean, making $1.3 million, that just the entire box office run of Locke would not pay his salary, would not close, come close to paying his salary, let alone making the movie and everything else that goes along with it. Uh, so, and therefore, and also, no studio, no financier is going to say, yeah, I bet if I put up $5 million of my own dollars, I'll bet I'll get a return on my investment. No, they won't. And so they're not going to put up $5 million or $10 million or $15 million, whatever it's going to take to do it. So, unfortunately, um, well, I love the film, and I think a very strong argument could be made that Tom Hardy, I mean, a lot of different years, Tom Hardy would have been nominated for Best Actor for his performance in Locke, but it was, as we've talked about many, many times, 2000, um, uh, this past Academy Awards was one of the more stacked Best Actor categories mm -hmm. uh, in a long, long time. I mean, Jake Gyllenhaal did not get a nomination for his role in Nightcrawler. That's how, that's how stacked it was. Um, so while a lot of us would love, well, there's not a lot of us who even saw Locke. Those of us who saw Locke would love to see a follow-up to it, but it, it, I just doubt that it's going to happen. But we'll all celebrate together if it does, but I think it's almost an impossibility. Yeah, some people online were talking about how he could have potentially been snubbed of an Oscar, so you don't think that he was just considering? Yeah, I a snubbed, no, he wasn't going to win. Mm -hmm. the, the, Tom Hardy, and you know, if I... if. If I don't feel like an actor has a legit shot of winning the yeah. award, then not getting a nomination is no snub. Do you that think mean, he has an Oscar in his future at some point? Absolutely. I would be shocked. I mean, the Oscar is the most difficult of almost any award yeah. to win because it's you against 900 other lead actors in movies that year. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly difficult. And, that, and I say this all the time, but it bears repeating. I mean, think about this. You're an actor, right? Goodness, let's, let's just look at the Academy Awards this year. Rosamund Pike gave the performance of a lifetime. She killed it. She crushed yeah. it in Gone Girl. She is absolute. Was that an Academy Award winning performance? You bet your yeah. ass that was an Academy Award winning performance. So, Oscar, right? <laughs> wah, wah. Unfortunately, she just so happened to have her performance of a lifetime in the same year that Julianne Moore gave the performance of a generation in Still Alice. Yeah. So, while you've got to not only completely have your talent and ripen your talent and sharpen your talent and become come to the peak of your powers and then find the right role that'll match that talent and then a great director who will really play it up to its full apex and then you crush it and knock it out of the park you then have to sit down <laughs> and cross your fingers that somebody else didn't happen to come along that year and do just a little bit better because 
unlike in most sports, in the Academy Awards, you can't play defense. There's nothing you can do to stop Julianne Moore from being as good as she is. All you can do is play <laughs> offense and give the best performance you can. And so with Tom Hardy, will there be an Oscar on his mantle? I will say yes. But it's look, if he keeps running into Leonardo DiCaprio for the rest of his career, it might become difficult. But let's put it this way. There are going to be multiple nominations. Of that, I have no doubt. There will be multiple nominations in Tom Hardy's future. And I will, I'll be surprised if 15 years from now, if we, we're having, we're still doing mailbag. Yeah. Um, and, and Tom Hardy doesn't have a trophy on his mantle. I'll be surprised. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> Sean V writes, good morning, AMC crew. My question is in regards to the 2015 box office. I think it's pretty obvious that the new Star Wars and Avengers will take the top two spots in worldwide box office gross. So my question is, with all these other huge movies coming out next year, what movies do you guys think will claim the next three spots for the top five? Well, I mean, it's let's start with the first part, with the first assumption that we're all making, that Star Wars and the uh, new Avengers film are going to be the top two box office films of the year. I assume that too. We all do. But there was nobody out there that assumed American Sniper would even be in the top five box office of 2014, and it ended up winning the box office. A lot of us felt that The Hunger Games would be the number one box office film of the year, and it just about was, but then out of nowhere came this hit that nobody saw being that big of a hit. Along comes American Sniper, takes it out. So while we can sit here, and I'm with you, and we can say, okay, we all know that Avengers and Star Wars will be the top two. Well, let's not lock the door on that as a, as a complete certainty just yet. I believe they will be. Uh, I believe most people believe they will be. So let's just go on that assumption for a second. Okay, so those that, what three other films will then come in and fill out the top five of the year? I believe it's going to be Jurassic World. Mm -hmm. I, I, think that'll be, I think there's too much... There's too much going for this film. You got the star power of Chris Pratt right now coming off Guardians of the Galaxy, which everybody loved and saw 15 times. So that and it's the nostalgia of Jurassic Park and it's just a movie about freaking giant dinosaurs. <laughs> you just put all of that together and there is just, there's just too much success there. That movie, as long as it doesn't completely suck and have like a 70% week one to week two drop off at the box office, I believe Jurassic Park will be in that top five. Uh, another one is, I believe this is pretty much a lock. I believe the final Hunger Games film is going to be in the top five. For a lot of people, I really liked the last Hunger Game mm -hmm. film. But for a lot of people, it was the weakest of all the Hunger Games films. And it still almost ended up being the number one box office film of the year. The final installment of the Hunger Games, I have no doubt, will be, it might even give Avengers and Star Wars and mm -hmm. run for its money for the top two spots. I don't really think so, but it's, it's as an outside shot, it could. But I absolutely, I complete, I'll be shocked if Hunger Games is not in the top five. Then there's two other films that are fighting for that last spot. And I'm not exactly sure which way to go on this. One is the movie that opened this week, which is Furious 7, Fast and Furious 7. The other film battling for what I think is that last spot in the top five is the Tom Cruise movie, Mission Impossible 5. Mm -hmm. The last one made a lot of money and everybody loved it. So it's riding on a high right now. The, the, those of us who saw, um, I keep wanting to just call it Live, Tie, Repeat, but Edge of Tomorrow <laughs> should have been called uh, All You Need Is Kill. But anyway, uh, Edge of Tomorrow loved Tom Cruise in that movie. He was so good in that movie. And now here he is again, back in the action saddle again with a franchise that he's been doing great in. A lot of people love what he did with Mission Impossible 4. It's going to give Fast and Furious 7 a run for its money. So I believe Jurassic World and the Hunger Games film will hold the three and four spot in whatever order. Mm -hmm. And then Furious and Mission Impossible will fight it out for that fifth spot. Now this is all not taking into consideration the whole American sniper, you know, gambit here. One of these, some film can come out of nowhere and shock us, but if I had to put my money on it and I had to pick one, I'm gonna say Furious 7 will get the fifth spot. So it's gonna be five of those six will be in the top five of the year, I, mean, I believe. you just named all these huge movies and when I read this question, um, 
probably because I just came back from Pixar, thanks to you guys. Um, oh yeah, you were at the, Pixar this, yeah, oh, I totally forgot yeah, about that. Yeah, and so now I have Pixar on my mind and we got to see a chunk of Inside Out oh, and yeah. they talked a little bit about that dinosaur movie, the No Good. Good the, Dinosaur. The good Dinosaur, yeah. Um, you about to say No Good no Dinosaur? Good, the no, no Good, good Dinosaur. dinosaur. <laughs> um, so do you think, Pixar has any chance because it's been a while since a Pixar movie came out. So maybe people are like really excited for a Pixar movie. Oh, uh, I look inside out is in my top five most yeah. anticipated films of the year. It I'm losing my mind. However, inside out presents an interesting, pro it's going to make a lot of money. Top five money. I don't think so. Inside out presents a very weird problem is that it, that it's a difficult movie to market. And while I have liked the trailers, I think I've mostly liked the trailers because I saw 15 minutes of the yeah. film uh, like a year and a half ago. And seeing 15 minutes of the film, you get to see it all in its context. I got so excited, it's crazy. But if I take that experience out of my head and just watch the trailers pretending I hadn't seen the 15 minutes, they're, they're not marvelous trailers. But I, I don't know how you make marvelous trailers for this movie. Because of that, I, think, I don't think Good Dinosaur is a threat at all. But what about the no good dinosaur? The, what, the no good dinosaur. <laughs> what about that guy? Now that that movie, if you put a rating R on that, <laughs> there you could have got a hit. But Inside Out, I think, is going to be a great movie. I think it's going to be better than great. I think it's going to be a magnificent film. Um, and I think it's going to make a lot of money. Maybe even top 10 money, but it, I just don't think it's going to make top five money. Right. Hope I'm wrong. <laughs> Chase writes, Hateful Eight was scheduled to release in November. It's one of my most anticipated movies. I go check my movie news like always, and the release has been taken down off IMDb. Know anything? Has it been moved? Um, as far as I know, like, well, first of all, the Hateful Eight poster came out uh, a while ago, a number of months ago, actually, and it just said 2015. There's no date. Now, I can't remember where it came from, but out of nowhere, this date materialized of November 2015. I don't know if it was ever official that that was it, but it just kind of became accepted that it was November 2015. And maybe it was. I, maybe I'm just not remembering it correctly. But yeah, everything I'm seeing is that no longer does it say November 2015 anywhere. It still says, everywhere I look still says 2015. They're still saying 2015, but they're not committing to November. Now, they're already in production. They may have actually finished shooting this movie by now, actually. We, we, we're probably, if they haven't finished shooting the film by now, they're probably getting close to finish shooting. Then you go into post-production. This is a film that will probably be ready for theaters, maybe even come August. But a lot of films, most films don't just go to theaters when they're ready. They're, you know, usually there's a wait time. Uh, so I still think this will come out in 2015, but I have not heard anything. I think it'll be between August and December, so that's a finite window. It'll be in there somewhere unless they really, you know, decide to pull one out of left field and say, okay, no, we're removing it to 2017 or, or something like that, or summer of 2016. But I haven't heard anything like that at this point, so I'm still expecting it to come out sometime between August and December, but I have not heard anything official. Um, if a movie does change its release date, because he said it was supposed to come out in November, um, what are some reasons that it would move, and are there any good reasons that it could move? I always assume that it's going to be bad. Yeah, well, sometimes, I mean, most of the time, the situation is they're moving it back three months or six months or a year or whatever. That's never a good sign. Yeah. Um, sometimes, very rarely, they move it up. Like Mission Impossible is supposed to come out in December, and boom, they moved it four or five or six months up, and now it's coming out this summer. So they actually moved it ahead. Mm -hmm. um, usually what happens is if a studio... Look, when you release movies is such a huge art and science to these studios and so important. Picking the right release date of a movie. Let's say a movie was going to, all other things being equal, just a wash across the board. Generally speaking, this movie was going to make $75 million at the box office. Putting that movie out on the wrong release date could mean that $75 million movie becomes a $64 million movie. Putting it out on the ideal date could mean that $75 million movie becomes a $91 million movie. And don't think for a second that the studios don't lose sleep, hire and fire people over $12 million. Because they do. Every single dollar counts. I mean, seriously, $12 million can be the difference between a, a, a studio having a party on the lot one weekend and laying 15 people off. You know, that's, that's how big of a difference it makes. That's how fine the, the, the margin is sometimes. So there is an art and a science. So it can be a situation of worst case scenario. This movie is not coming together 
the way we wanted it to come together. We need to schedule a month of reshoots. We need to take this back to the drawing board. We need to take this back into the editing bay. The director needs three more months to do this, whatever. We got to push it because of a problem with the movie. That is option number one. Another option, which I think is more normally the case, is the studio decides, you know what? This date that we have our movie planned for right now is no longer the right date. Either because another movie just got announced to open against it, or a date, say four or five months later, that was occupied by something else that made it a bad date. Maybe another movie moved off a date that has now become available. It's like, you know what? That date is better for our movie under these circumstances, and we're gonna move it. So that's option number two. Option number three, which is the more rare of the occasions, is the Mission Impossible situation, where it's like, we're gonna move the movie up. Now, I'm not talking about moving it up one week or two weeks, but like significantly up. And they just figure, you know what? We think there's an opportunity here. We are ahead of schedule. We have everything in place that we really need, and we feel comfortable we can have the movie we want in the shape we want it in to be in theater by this date, and that date would be a good plan for us. Even though two months ago, we didn't think that date would work for us, Let's make the move and do it. So those are the three scenarios. I, I think the, the most common scenario is just the science of picking the right release date and the re right release date opening up. Um, then second would be there's a problem with our movie and they push it back. And then third is the more rare thing. Hey, let's move it up because we're ready. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, next question comes from Edward J. And they write, could Batman v Superman be overcrowded? Oh, man, this overcrowded question comes up an awful lot. I'm going to pull up a thing here. Uh, days of Future Past. Okay. The question always comes up with almost any movie. That movie's getting too crowded. <laughs> they just listed six characters in it. That movie is too crowded. Okay. I think the vast majority of us will agree. Not everybody, because no movie gets everybody agreeing. But the vast majority of us will agree that X-Men Days of Future Past was an awesome movie was paced well and all that kind of stuff and didn't feel overcrowded. However, in that movie, you had Wolverine, Charles Xavier, Magneto, Mystique, Storm, Beast, Rogue, Kitty Pride, Trask, uh, Iceman, Bishop, Quicksilver, Striker, Colossus, Blink, uh, Warpath. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of some more that were in there. Anyway, on and on and on. There were a lot of characters. A lot of characters. The, the issue about overcrowding a movie is not, are there too many people in this movie? Even a, a conservative romantic comedy will have 50 or 60 characters in their film at any one time. That doesn't mean every character has a significant role. That doesn't mean every character even has lines. That doesn't mean any of that kind of stuff. The question is not, how many characters do you have there? The question is always, how do you use your character? I know it sounds like I'm talking about something else, but I'm not. The question is not, how big is your character list? The character is, how do you use your character list? That is the real question here. And when you looked at a movie like X-Men Days of Future Past, were there tons of mutants in that thing? Yes, there were. But did it feel crowded? No, because they used each one just right. They knew how many you know, characters to just give little one lines, yet make it feel like they had significant presences in it, but focus the majority of your screen time on four or five key characters. Now, go to something like The Amazing Spider-Man 2, a movie that I, I happen to like, but I did not love, and I thought it was a big step down from The Amazing Spider-Man 1, but a lot of people hate that movie. And there's good reasons to hate it. Gwen Stacy forever. <laughs> and I love Gwen Stacy <laughs> that. But really, when you look at it, that movie is not crowded. There are only a couple of key characters. The problem is how badly they were used and how badly they budgeted the screen time for each of them and what they use the screen time. And when you butcher that, suddenly a fair number of characters suddenly feels overburdened and suddenly feels overcrowded. So... I, no, I, I'm not worried at all. I, I, look, I have a lot of things I'm worried about for Batman versus Superman, just because I'm so excited for it that I want it to be good so badly. Um, I think there are a number of concerns you can have, but one of the concerns that I personally don't have at all is this concern of it's going to feel crowded. Because somebody can say, wait a minute, it's going to have Wonder Woman, and it's going to have Cyborg, and it's going to have Aquaman. It's going to be, yeah, but like I just said, X-Men had Bishop and Colossus and Blink and Warpath and Kitty Pride and Rogue and Beast and Storm and Wolverine and blah, blah, on and on and on and on. How are they going to be used? That's the key thing. 
We won't know that till we see the movie, but I have a lot of faith in it. I have a lot of trust in it. I do not think overcrowding is going to be the issue. Do you think no matter how fabulous this movie hmm. is going to be, that someone, people are just going to complain about it? Of They're course. just going to find things to complain about. Sure, but that's the beauty of it, right? That's the beautiful thing about it is all film is subjective. And, and that means there is no movie ever created in the history of mankind that everybody hated. They just, that movie doesn't exist. That's, there's, it's going to appeal to some people. There is no movie that has ever been created that everybody loves. Mm -hmm. Doesn't exist, and that is the best thing. For some people, that's a frustrating thing about movies. To me, it's the most beautiful and the most awesome thing about movies, is that no matter how great I think a movie is, you know, Dennis can come to me and say, man, I hated that movie. And I go, what? And then, because he'll have a completely different perspective than I will, and then we can engage and we can each call each other crazy or whatever, but we'll learn from different perspectives and things like that, I think is the best thing about it. So will there be, no matter how great Batman versus Superman is, will there be people that complain about it? Absolutely, yeah. and that's the way it should be. Yeah. <laughs> Next question comes from S. Duffy and they write, Hey AMC, I recently found the show and I really appreciate the work that goes into all of your content. My question is about the upcoming Deadpool movie. Do you think that in the movie, Ryan Reynolds' Deadpool will make reference to X-Men Origins Wolverine and what they did with the character in that film? I think that could be hilarious. Just a thought, thanks. I was having this exact conversation with a friend of mine because Look, one of the things about Deadpool, you gotta take some liberties here, right? Because this isn't exactly the way his power works, but one of Deadpool's mutant powers is that he does break the fourth wall. He is, he is conscious of the fact that he is a comic book character. He lives outside of it in many ways. And I'm sure they're gonna carry that over the movie. Ryan Reynolds has pretty much said so. But what that can also mean is even though the events of X-Men Wolverine, I, I believe are no longer part of the continuity because of the whole time reset that X-Men Days of Future Past did, I think there is comedic gold sitting there of, even though it's not a part of the timeline anymore because it was erased by X-Men Days of Future Past, if Wade, aka Deadpool, was completely aware of the events in X-Men Origins Wolverine and is completely aware of himself in that movie and what happened to him in that movie and one of the most unimaginable gaffes any movie has ever made where you take a character who is known as the Merc with a mouth and then surgically seal his mouth. I, I don't understand what they were thinking. They were, I, I'm not suggesting anything, but they were doing a lot of drugs. Uh, I'd say, hey, I know, let's take the guy, let's take the Merc with a mouth. And let's take the blob and make him skinny. Yeah, I know, it, it made no sense. I think there is comedic gold there to be mined to have Deadpool cognizant of that movie. And that even though nobody else will know what he's talking about in his world, nobody else will know because it, it doesn't exist. But if he knows about it and makes some, some jokes about having his mouth removed or something like that, I think those of us who had the misfortune of watching X-Men Origins Wolverine <laughs> will laugh a lot. I, think, I, th I hope they do it. I think that would be really cool if they did. I read that um, I think a couple years ago in Variety that he said that it was in the script at that time, but that was also two years ago, so God knows that changed. Um, <laughs> you made um, a, a separate video about it, but how happy are you about the R rating? Well, you know, here's the thing. I, I'm very happy about it, but, it, but I'm not as happy as a lot of people simply because as a fan, I was content. I, I would have been perfectly happy with the PG-13 Deadpool. I wanted an R-rated Deadpool. If it was up to me, I would make it R-rated. But at the same time, just what you can do in film today, you could have, I think you could have made a PG-13 Deadpool. Because remember folks, look, everybody, there are a lot of people out there right now who are treating like, R, that means it's gonna be awesome. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of R-rated movies that completely suck. Mm -hmm. So don't think R is somehow a magic formula to a good movie, it's not. It just means it's a bad movie with more F-bombs. That's all it means. Um, but I, I think the way they're handling this movie is so good, really, right from the marketing of it. Did you fall the, for the April Fool's show? Oh, of course I did. Yeah, <laughs> I absolutely fell for it. When, when he came out, because generally speaking in the movie world, right, when you April Fool's news, you April Fool's what some people would think is great news. Like, <laughs> Harrison Ford announces he's gonna do four more Indiana Jones films, ah! April Fool's, right? But what happened was, they brilliantly, Ryan Reynolds brilliantly 
played to the assumption we all had anyway that it was going to be PG-13. Okay, okay, guys. And he fought, he really pressed it home by saying, but don't worry, man. We're still, <laughs> there's going to be chimichangas. And he even swore in his tweet, there's going to be an S ton of this action. Great chimichangas breaking the fourth wall. It's going to be awesome. Trust me. He sold it. He so sold it and it got us all to buy in. But then that video he did with, uh, I, just, I just call him AC Slater. Uh, the video he did with uh, uh, oh, Mario, Mario Lopez. Lopez. Yes, Mario Lopez, right? <laughs> the, the video he did with Mario Lopez, he was so great in it. The way they've handled it so far, if this is any indication of the spirit they're going to bring to the movie itself, even if it looks cheap, because they're doing it on a small budget, relatively, even if it looks cheap, I think we're in for a hell of a good time. So uh, I'm very, I'm happy they mm -hmm. did it R, but I would have been cool if they did PG-13. But I... I really think this is shaping up to be something special. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Nathan writes, hello, everyone at AMC. I love all the new shows and watch them as soon as they are available. Awesome. Thank you. I wanted to talk about Terminator. I am one of the few people who enjoyed Terminator Salvation. I liked how it didn't go, let's send a Terminator back and kill John Connor, but took place in a world where Judgment Day still happened. So my question is, with this new Terminator, do you like that they are going back to sending a Terminator back in time to kill Sarah Connor or would you like for them to have kept it in the post apocalyptic era and do a new story on how John Connor became the leader of the resistance no 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 I, I wouldn't want it that I like I hey look all mm -hmm. films subjective and I'm really glad that you enjoyed um, Terminator uh, waste of time what, what was it called Terminator <laughs> salvation Terminator. I'm really really glad you enjoyed it I, I honestly am and I know a couple of people that enjoyed it I hated that film um, there are a number of people in this room that hated that film. And I think it would have been a mistake. Terminator, I, I think at some point in the Terminator franchise, you take a shot at telling the post-apocalyptic uh, battle part. But the heart and soul of Terminator is about the battle for that future. And the battle to try to either prevent or alter or some, somehow uh, you know, fight off that future. That's the heart and soul of the Terminator mythology and story. I believe you bring it back, but it also now looks like they're pulling at X-Men Days of Future Past in many ways. They come back just the way they did in the first Terminator, but now the timeline has been altered. Something is now different. They're living in that time of the first Terminator, but now it's, things are completely different. Because we see that as the first Terminator now shows up in the little time bubble that he's supposed to with Arnold standing up naked in the street like the, that iconic scene from the very first Terminator movie. Instead, now, there's an older Arnold Schwarzenegger standing there waiting for him, saying, I've been waiting for you, bam, and kills him. Completely changes the history. What did that do? Look, I'm not saying the new Terminator film is going to be awesome. I know some people don't like the new trailers. I actually, I did. I've enjoyed the trailers so far. I'm not jumping up and down about them, but I like them. I think if you're going to do a new Terminator today, I think the approach they're taking is the right approach. And I think they're doing the right things. That still may not end up being a good movie, but it's at least giving me some hope. So I'm, I'm curious about it. Do you think Terminator can ever exist without Arnold Schwarzenegger? Yes. Really? Yeah, I really do. And I honestly, I think there was a very underappreciated Terminator, the Sarah Connor Chronicles uh, television show that I think showed you can do the Terminator uh, storyline and mythology and all that kind of stuff sans Arnold Schwarzenegger. I think you can do it. I'm not saying it'll be better off without Schwarzenegger, but I, th the story of Terminator is not a really about the one robot. It's not about the Terminator. It's about humanity and it's war against the machines. Now it sounds like I'm talking about the Matrix. Um, <laughs> you could do a shared cinematic universe, by the way, very easily with the Terminator and the Matrix. Just saying, look it up anyway. Um, but yeah, you could, you, you totally could. And But I like that he's back for this one. And it sounds like They've come up with a really good logic hook for why he's there and he's older and all that kind of stuff. So I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit excited for it. Yeah, me too. All right, that was our last question for the day. Thanks so much for joining us, guys. It was so good to be back here nice today. Nice to have you yeah, back. thanks. Um, just a reminder, lots of great movies being shown in AMC Theaters, so go ahead and head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your showtimes, movies, and ticket information. And if you want a podcast version of this episode, check out the description box below, and make sure to click that subscribe button. Thanks to the guys in the room, Dennis and Jonathan, and thanks to John. John, where can people find you online? You can find me, uh, follow me on 
on Twitter and on Facebook by following me at John Campy. And also don't forget to check out the various AMC uh, Phase 3 shows, AMC Heroes, AMC Jedi Council, AMC Coming Soon, AMC Rewind. Of course, make sure you check out our indie shows as well, AMC Indie Spotlight. Oh yeah, check all of them out. And you guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Ashley Mova. And I hope you guys are having a great weekend and we will catch you next time. Bye guys.